Hey guys, it's Steven. I'm an anesthesiologist and a medical ethicist. I'm mostly making this video for friends and family members on Facebook um, who have been sending me this video um, over the last 24, 48 hours featuring this group of physicians. Dr. Stella Emanuel, she's addressing a crowd and talking once again about hydroxychloroquine and its role in treating COVID patients. My buddy, uh, Rob Drummond, he's an MD, PhD who trained at Hopkins. He had a fantastic post that kind of broke down the things that she was saying. And to piggyback off of that, the first thing he started out by talking about was, you know, not all physicians are scientists. So we say we are physician scientists. I consider myself a physician scientist, but there's levels to that. I'm not currently engaged in any uh, active research, definitely not any randomized controlled trials, but I am a scientist in the fact that I know how to read research studies and in some regard, how to start and initiate a research project. And I could read these different studies and break down the methods and the materials and figure out what the um, researchers, what their intentions are and how they produced their data. But I would not consider myself a scientist by any stretch of the imagination. So what we do have are our scientists at NIH that are working to make the um, vaccines and study how coronavirus is spread. All those guys are scientists. Dr. Fauci is a physician scientist. He's actively engaged in research and is our expert on um, this novel coronavirus. So to break down what Dr. Emanuel says, you know, I'm not gonna talk about her character or how good of a physician is she is. I don't know. I don't know her. I didn't spend the time to look her up. I just wanted to address the comments that she shared in the video I saw, which is about four minutes long, and it was just her speaking. I did catch a glimpse of the main video, and the first thing that started was another physician started talking about this culture of fear and how fear is being uh, perpetuated by the media and all this stuff. And to be completely honest, as a physician, I'm saying that we don't need to live in fear about coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, you know, we're, we're missing the mark if the only thing you've been getting through the media and through the news is that we should be afraid of coronavirus. Please don't be afraid. Talk to your physicians. You know, if anything, it's a time that we should be uh, gathered around with our families and loved ones and supporting each other. We should not live in fear. Um, just follow the recommended guidelines and policies and do, you know, live your life. Do your best to, li to live your life and enjoy life. If you're gonna catch corona, you're gonna catch it. So don't don't live in fear. And unfortunately, that um, story has been perpetuated by the media and different groups. Um, I know the people that I usually work with and deal with were not perpetuating that and encouraging fear. So I'm sorry that some people out there are genuinely scared. Um, I understand it, but you you don't need to live in fear. So first off, want to get that out the way. Second, so. Dr. Emanuel, she made a couple of points. I took notes on the video. I'm not gonna do the whole like side by side where I counter every argument, but she talks about hydroxychloroquine. She says she has 350 patients uh, that have multiple comorbidities that she treats as outpatients um, using hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and zithromax, the antibiotic. That's great. That's great that her patients did okay, um, you know, per what she's saying. I'm not gonna dispute that she had 350 patients survive that's a drop in the bucket, that data does not necessarily extrapolate. We don't know other factors involved in the patient's care and they were outpatient coronavirus, uh, COVID positive patients. So since this was not a research study, this is all anecdotal information that she is providing, we really can't extrapolate that to anybody. It's great that these patients did okay per what she's saying, but we can't, it doesn't help us at all. Um, we know this is from a, an article in The Lancet, Infectious Disease. It was published in June of 2020. Updated numbers on uh, coronavirus prevalence. 80% of people that are positive for coronavirus, 80% of COVID positive patients experience mild to moderate symptoms. These symptoms do not require hospitalization. You can go home, you can sit on your couch. Hopefully your symptoms don't progress and become worse. 15% of people that are COVID positive can have severe symptoms. These are the folks that come into the hospital, they're admitted, maybe you need supplemental oxygen, maybe you need some medication um, and supportive care, 
and that's when we started acting all these other treatments. And then 6% of these people are going into the ICU. Uh, those are the ones that you're concerned about, the proning, where they're laying on their belly, where they have invasive uh, lines and, and IVs, and um, you know potentially intubation with the breathing tube. So 80% of people that are COVID positive should be just fine. So we don't know out of these 350 patients that uh, Dr. Emanuel saw, how many of them were gonna be part of that 80% or how many did she spare from becoming that 15 or 6% that needed invasive support by giving them this treatment regimen. We can't draw any conclusions from the numbers that she provided. It was worthless. Um, you know, and she, there was no control either. So did these patients go home and, and each drink a bottle of water every night before uh, for bed? Are these patients active and healthy and, and exercising regularly? Were they able to appropriately isolate? We don't know that. She didn't share that information, so we can't extrapolate. That doesn't help us. Um, so she talked about prevention, and then she brought up some NIH study from 2005. I think she got the dates mixed up because we weren't really dealing with this novel coronavirus, obviously, in 2005, if it came in 2019. So I assume she got the dates mixed up. She mentioned some NIH study about uh, hiccups being a symptom of coronavirus, and this was uh, made evident by treating them with hydroxychloroquine. It doesn't make any sense. I, I don't know what she's trying to get at or how that proves that hydroxychloroquine helps. This is, again, these are quotes directly from her three-minute speech. Um, and then she discredits the effectiveness of a double-blind study. She said it's worthless if your patients are dying. Right then and there, she lost all credibility um, of becoming even remotely a physician scientist because as uh, Dr. Drummond said in his post, and as a lot of us in the science community know, the double-blinded randomized controlled trial is like the gold standard of, of uh, maintaining or of, of acquiring evidence that something is working. Um, when it comes to these different research studies, so a double-blinded randomized controlled trial, a randomized controlled trial, you're gonna take an experimental group and a control group and you select for all the variables so that the only thing that you're really looking at is that one thing that you've changed. So if we're looking at uh, the effectiveness of hydroxychloroquine, you're gonna select these patients into two control, into a, into a control group, into an experimental group, and look only at hydroxychloroquine. So she discredited that and says she's gonna be fine with her anecdotal data on using hydroxychloroquine. Furthermore, she goes on to emphatically state that we have the cure for coronavirus and patients still need to die. But the whole time she's been talking, she's been talking about hydroxychloroquine as a means of prevention that you take before you have um, full-blown coronavirus with symptoms. So that that's the discrepancy um, right then and there. So, you know, people are gonna believe whatever they wanna believe. People are concerned that things are being hidden because this video keeps getting taken down. Um, dare I use the term fake news, you know, leaving these videos up just help perpetuate that fear and perpetuate this misinformation. This, this stuff that she's talking is, is garbage, uh, doesn't hold any value. And I'm all for open communication, but you need to approach it in the right way. You need to speak as those in the science community speak with val valid data and, and evidence, whatever evidence we do have. So the um, evidence that we do have when it comes to hydroxychloroquine, I mean, there's been a lot of, of studies published and that are being worked on now. People talk about, oh, we know it's safe because we've used it for years. Yeah, we know about the safety and the dosage of hydroxychloroquine, especially when used for the, the correct, um, to, to treat specific illnesses. But even with treatment of those illnesses, there's a therapeutic window where if you get above this dose, you're gonna start dealing with the side effects of hydroxychloroquine. Um, the most recent article that I just happened to pull up is from June of 2020. It's a randomized controlled trial, a randomized trial of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19. So, and the reason I'm gonna go through this because people you know, don't believe Dr. Fauci, apparently you can't trust him or whatever, sure. 
Dr. Fauci is not the good Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I, mean, I don't have faith and trust in Fauci, but as a physician, small s scientist, the things he says lines up with the papers and the research that I have personally read. If there's anything that he says that I don't agree with, I'll look it up, I'll read the papers. And you too can look up these papers. It's gonna be pretty dense reading. It's gonna be a lot of statistics and stuff, but if you really want to learn you can look through these papers and you can find it from the source. Now, if you believe that the data from this, these papers is like, you know, political and, and paid, oh, I, I can't help you with that. So that's why I'm gonna break down this, this article. You know, forget about Dr. Fauci, just look at the research. If you can't abide by this research, then again, I don't know what to tell you. So in this randomized controlled trial, randomized trial of hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis for COVID-19, all these research papers will have methods in which they describe how they did what they did along with the results and then they'll have a brief conclusion this is kind of in the abstract portion of the paper and you know the research paper itself may go on for three or five or twelve pages um, but if you're just starting out and you're interested you know look here so they looked in the methods they said a randomized double blind placebo controlled trial across the u.s and canada testing hydroxychloroquine as post-exposure prophylaxis they enrolled adults with confirmed COVID-19 at a distance, uh, COVID-19 exposure at a distance less than six feet for more than 10 minutes while wearing neither a face mask nor eye shield. So this is a high risk. And then they also included moderate risk exposures. Within four days after, they assigned patients randomly to receive either placebo or hydroxychloroquine. So the random assignment is important because that helps take out bias. When you have that double blind um, randomized trial, the intentions are to take out bias from the patients. The patients don't know what medications they're receiving and the physicians in, engaged in giving, giving them the medication don't know either. So that helps eliminate that bias that can corrupt these studies. So they gave some patients placebo and some patients hydroxychloroquine. The primary outcome they were looking at was the incidence of either laboratory confirmed COVID-19 or illness compatible with COVID-19 in 14 days. That's the incubation period of the virus. So they enrolled 821 asymptomatic patients. Uh, I'm gonna summarize some of this. The incidence of new illness compatible with COVID-19 did not differ significantly between participants receiving hydroxychloroquine and those receiving placebo. There's some numbers in there, 11% um, versus 14%. Um, the absolute difference um, was negative 2.4 percentage points. There's a confidence interval. So all this stuff you, you kinda have to understand statistics to break it down. Side effects were more common with hydroxychloroquine than with placebo, but no serious adverse reactions were reported. So the conclusion of all this was after high risk or moderate risk exposure to COVID-19, hydroxychloroquine did not prevent illness compatible with COVID-19 or confirmed infections when used as post-exposure prophylaxis within four days after exposure. So does this paper kind of support my views on hydroxychloroquine? Absolutely. If it doesn't support your views, then look for another paper. Keep reading, keep reading, see what other pieces of information, see what other research studies show. And eventually, you know, you can work yourself into that uh, that box where you prove to yourself that hydroxychloroquine works based upon these papers that I've read, not based upon this group of physicians that's standing on the, on the porch of the White House or Capitol speaking, you know, dogma, not based upon the media and the articles, because what these articles will do or the, or the media, they will take these journal articles and boil down the conclusions into a nice juicy headline that's gonna polarize you. And if you believe hydroxychloroquine works, you're gonna click on that title, you're gonna read that article, and the article's gonna loosely summarize what I just read to you. So that is the difference between taking it from the media and actually doing your own research. The research has actually already been done, but read what's been done and you can figure out for yourself. Forget about Fauci, forget about Facebook. And the reason I'm making this video, I'm tired. I'm tired of having to talk about this. Um, you know, I'm all for autonomy. If you don't believe Fauci, that's fine. But, um, you know, trying to be consistent because Dr. Fauci literally wrote the textbook that all of internal medicine physicians use during their residency training. So I don't know, did he start lying? now that he was a lion back then 
if he was lying back then, then his whole textbook that trained all the internal medicine physicians, you know, what are we? What do we, what do we have? What, what even is medicine? So if you made it this far, thank you. Share this if someone needs more stuff explained to them. Um, again, I do not consider myself a true physician scientist. I just like to take what evidence I have and I can put my hands on and disseminate that, try and make it clearer for, for other people. So thank you. Um, hopefully this helps. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below.